Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proof. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. This Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. I'm Lou Perez, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Like a pro. I love this. Lou Perez is a comedian. This is one of our Save the Brave shows. You know, as as we pull ourselves out of the whole COVID thing, you know, we're going to start getting comedy shows going again. And that means that at some point, the Bastards Canteen down at Temecula and their performance stage will be open and running. And in an effort to season that whole thing and get you guys thinking about Save the Brave comedy, Bastards Canteen, we have our comedy expert, Matt Ballacher in house, who's always booking these great comedians. So we take these Friday shows and just kind of shine the light on the charity and also shine the light on a comedian. And I love it that we do these on Friday, Matt, because I have a beer, <laughs> Pacifico, not sponsored. And thanks for all, first off for doing these things with me. They're so much fun. And then tell us a little about Lou Perez. All right, well, Pete, you don't have to wait till Friday to drink beer. You know, you can do that any morning you want to. But I'm excited about this next guest. He's, he's a Webby Award-winning writer, hell of a comedian, an under-the-radar fashionista, and an all-around good guy. Uh, please join me in welcoming the wonderful and, and kind of woolly Lou Perez. How are you doing, Lou? I'm, I'm very woolly. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me, guys. I wish I had a Pacifico right now. That's a, a very smooth <laughs> beverage. And if Pacifico is interested in having a spokesman that not a lot of people know, I'm down. I'm I have down one for you. Pacifico. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so in doing the research for the show there's a lot of things to to ask you about and i guess i'll just start with the basic question one of the things we have a lot of different people from a lot of different creative professions right and if you say oh he's a comedian i have to now qualify what the fuck that even means right like it does he work for burritos which is fine you know is he an open micer does he play stadiums so how would you categorize like you know, it's like someone's an actor. Yes, they have been in a movie and they might have even starred in it. But are they really an actor? Yes, but yet. To, so same thing with comedians. How do you qualify what a comedian is and isn't? Well, for one, thank you so much for saying comedian and not something like humorist. Um, <laughs> that That is a nightmare that I have someone calling me a humorist. Well, yeah, when it when it comes to comedy, I think I think things have changed a lot over the years. Um, you know, back in the day when you would say you're a comedian, I think people would automatically think, oh, you're a stand-up comic. That, that's what you do. But with the advent of, uh, of social media, in particular with YouTube and all that, as a comedian, I do, I do a bunch of things. So my main uh, shtick is producing online content. So it'd be like sketch comedy, that sort of thing. And I also I also do stand up comedy. Um, I haven't done it in a little while, but uh, I also do that. And um, also, you know, developing ideas for you know more traditional uh, media like uh, uh, TV and well now streaming services and, and movies as well. So I do a little bit of it all. So which I think you have to. So does yeah, that make you a comedian? Really Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think I, I think I think it makes me a comedian. It, it's it's wild because I've been doing comedy in some form or another ever since college. So I started in college. I was probably twenty or twenty one, and I started doing uh, improv comedy and then live sketch comedy. So uh, you know, the, obviously, especially when you when you're first starting out, there is that struggle of like, hey, can I call myself a comedian if I'm not actually making money? You know, and definitely the the first I don't know how many years in this industry, I was paying a lot of money to do comedy, <laughs> you know, whether, whether it was, you know, uh, going to open mics and paying five bucks and sitting around for an hour to get my three to five minutes or me and my, and my uh, longtime uh, comedy partner, Greg Burke, putting in our own money to produce our, our own videos, you know, so, so there is that struggle like, Oh, when can I you know say that I'm, that I'm a, uh, that I'm a comedian. And, um, I think uh, I think I got you know sort of the um, uh, the courage to call myself a comedian, not necessarily when I was you know making bank <laughs> from it, uh, but when I was treating it like a job and consistently going out uh, and performing in front of live audiences, uh, you know consistently working, putting out new material. 
people could expect to see or hear new stuff from me uh, regularly. So it was like, yeah, you know what? I'm a, I'm a comedian. I'm not where I want to be yet, but I, but I am a comedian. And for the past five years or so, all the way up to the end of last year, 2020, I was supporting myself as a, uh, as a comedian. So I was very fortunate uh, for that. Yeah. You're in the 1% then. So congratulations. And <laughs> before that, Lou, like when, you know, post-college, what were some of the jobs you did to kind of help sponsor your comedic aspiration? My biggest sponsors, I have to say, is that I'm very privileged in that I, I had parents who, who loved their, their weird artistic son very much and, uh, and definitely gave me a hand. But when it came to uh, jobs that I, that I had, the one I always have to talk about, uh, the first job I had coming out of, uh, out of college, I, came out, I graduated from NYU and I was basically uh, an English major. And the first job I landed was writing erotic fiction for a living, writing erotica. So uh, it, it sounds glamorous. You know, it sounds like, oh, to, to write this stuff, you have to look like the buff dudes on the cover of romance novels. But, uh, but really, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't elegant at all. So I, I, I saw an ad on Craigslist back when, you know, you could book gigs on Craigslist. And, it was, mm -hmm. and the question was very simple. It was like, would you like to write and edit erotic fiction? And I'm like, oh, that sounds fun. So I had to write a, uh, a sample story and send it in. So I'd never written one before and I, I sent one in and I got, a, uh, I got an interview and I ended up getting the gig. And so for a few months, I think I lasted like three months, Monday through Friday, I would go down to lower Manhattan, sit uh, in an office building in a cubicle and write ridiculous smut, like really gross dude centric, stuff uh and uh there was act, there was a readership there there was a readership that was able to fund basically uh, i think there had to be at least at least 12 people working full-time at this place you know so this wow. is like this is like back in the day so this is like probably you know 2005 or 2006 where this was happening and uh you know, I, I look, you know, I look back on that and it's, it was sort of like, it was kind of similar with, with comedy in that I had an audience, you know, like not a lot of people who want to be, who are aspiring to be a writer. They say, they say, you know what? I want to write erotic fiction under, a pen <laughs> uh, under a pen name in particular. And I want my stuff to be on really cheap pulp, uh, you know, pulp paper and going out to, you know, dudes in, in a, in a cabin in Nebraska. You know, like people that people don't think that, but here I am, I'm putting that out or there. Or Southern California in my case. Yeah. Or Southern California. Um, oh, but you guys have the real porn there. I mean, come on. You guys, <laughs> you guys don't have to mess with my my stupid words on the page. Um, but it was, you know, sort of, you know, looking back, it's like, wow, but I was writing stuff that was entertaining an audience. And how cool is that? And shortly after I left the the job, I ended up going to, to graduate school for creative writing. And it was interesting being in a, in a creative writing setting where people were writing stories, right? Spending all this time writing stories in the hopes of getting them published in a literary magazine that maybe has a circulation of like a thousand, you know? So you're, you're spending all this time writing the story, you put it out there, nobody reads it. But yet this guy over here is writing Nasty Nymphos number 16, and that's going out there and getting, a, and getting an audience. So, you know. So did you put that on your creative writing application? I don't remember. I don't think I, I, I don't know if I did. I, I think I probably brought it up uh, during uh, like, you know, one of the, the icebreakers. Uh, and it was always like a, it was always a solid icebreaker, you know, because it, it it's such a ridiculous, it, it was such a ridiculous job and such a, you know, you don't meet many people who are actually doing that sort of thing. And the fact that I was able to fall into it uh, was, uh, was pretty funny and, and, and apt too. I think I was, a uh, I was able to, you know, uh, use a lot of my, my creepy, <laughs> my creepy thoughts and also comedic thoughts in, in, in a way too, to write these stories. Because I mean, the reality is, I mean, so many of these stories could be read as just jokes, you know, it like, <laughs> you know, it's just the, the most ridiculous, you know, uh, situations. So. <laughs> Little known Pete facts. My uh, my letter back in the eighties was printed in Penthouse Forum, so I did not make any money, but I did get a free T-shirt. Thank you very much. And what was what was the substance of the letter? You know, my ten inch 
MX Missile of Love, all that kind of thing. And it was just <laughs> completely fabricated, but I thought, I'm 18, I may as well write this thing, see what happens. And then, and you know, this is back in the olden times when you'd write something and send it off into a black hole. And then six months later, you'd get a response with the bag of the shirt. And you're like, yes, best day ever. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's that's where the story ends. I wore the shirt a lot. It was true. The story was not. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love to learn more about your recent article in the Wall Street Journal. First, the backstory on, on how you were published in the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, so I had um, I had a number of friends hit me up with a link. Um, via uh, via Twitter about this academic study that was being put together. And the study was about, quote unquote, uh, the growth of right wing echo chambers on YouTube, right? Which already sounds scary. You know, that's a scary oh. thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so my friends were sharing it with me because if you turn to the last page of it, they had a number of channels that they had labeled far right. And one of the channels listed was the comedy channel that I used to work for, that I used to be the head writer and producer of, which was We the Internet TV. So here I am looking at this, uh, at this list of far-right channels, and I see We the Internet uh, you know, <laughs> posted there. And that was very awkward because while they didn't post my name, if you go to We the Internet, even now, I'm all over the place. Like my my mug is there. My you know I'm in I'm in the description. I am I am you know I'm there. You know that Lou Perez is associated with this thing, and I was thinking like oh that that kind of sucks. But then I didn't really think about it. And then uh, a friend of mine, uh, we started we started talking more about it. And the more we talked about it, the more pissed off I got because I was like wait a minute, uh, I, I had um, lost my job in October of last year, and I'm like wait it's not like I still have a gig. <laughs> you know, and this thing is out there, you know, it's like, wait, I'm going to be, you know, sending out my resume and trying to talk to people about collaborations and seeing if anybody needs a writer or a producer and all that. And now I'm going to have this thing, this, uh, cl- this uh, classification of far right hanging over my head. And I, I started getting pissed and I'm like, you know, I got a, uh, uh, my friend said, you know, you should write something, you should write something or, or make a video response or something like that. And my friend was actually able to put me in touch with an editor at the Wall Street Journal. So I pitched him uh, the idea. I wrote it up, and he said, uh, "I'll I'll run with this." And one of the weird, definitely one of the weird things about the this study, and it had yet to be peer reviewed, but it was out there. You know, the people that they were classifying as far right wasn't just we the internet TV. It was also Joe Rogan, uh, the Joe Rogan experience in particular. It was. Brett Weinstein, it was Sam Harris, it was Blogging Heads TV. And it was just sort of like, what world are you? uh, They're talking about, you know, the far right echo chamber. And it's like, what echo chamber must you be living in to classify (laughs) Joe Rogan, Brett Weinstein, Blogging Heads TV as far right? You're you're out of your mind. You're you're uh, you're batshit crazy. I'm really thankful uh, for one, I'm thankful for my friends for pointing this out to me. I'm thankful for my friend. Um, his uh, name is uh, Noam, uh, f- Noam for uh, hooking me up uh, with the Wall Street Journal, and obviously for the Wall Street Journal for for running it. And uh, uh, and yeah, so and and overall, the response that I got to what I wrote was was really positive. So I was you know I was happy about that. Well, far more people listen to this than read the Wall Street Journal. So can you? S- summarize, you know, you're clearly then just an alt right weirdo, or or how would you? Oh God! Oh no, an alt right. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just I'm just uh, messing with you. So, <laughs> what, but what what was the? I mean, I know you. I know you're not. But like, what what would you have wanted to be called? The way that I put it, and uh, it, on on Twitter, the some of the responses that I got, some of the hateful responses I got were great, you know, because it just it gave me the opportunity to to clarify even more. And uh, uh-huh. I. I can't tell you the amount of people who are like, oh, you're just a whiny bitch, man. You're a whiny bitch complaining about cancel culture. Meanwhile, you know, I'm sure you're going to work, you know, just and all that. And and w- what I needed to explain was, look, it's not whining when you're setting the record straight. Like if somebody, <laughs> you know, if somebody doesn't want to hire me, if somebody doesn't want to work with me, I want it to at least be for something that's true. I want it to be for something that I have actually said or done. You don't have to make <laughs> shit up about me. And I said, look, you can, uh, and, and Matt, we follow each other on social media. You can go down my, um, 
you know, my uh, my I social agree. media, my Twitter and all that and find plenty of reasons, plenty of reasons, <laughs> you know, to, to come after me and not, you know, uh, and not want to work with me. Um, but at least those are in reality. So, yeah. the, so that, that was sort of the, uh, you know, the big thing that I was trying to, uh, to put out there. And also just like the, the ugliness and the ease with which you can dismiss people because they've been categorized uh, in a certain way. You know, oh, uh, so-and-so is far right. Must be far right. You know, it, it's a little and, hard to take folks seriously when they do this stuff. And, and I pick on the left quite a bit because I expect more of them. I expect the right to be dismissive of people and get shit wrong. That's what they do as a norm. But the left is supposed to be better than this. You know, like you find one data point that may or may not be construed as something that's not in agreement with who you are. And all of a sudden you get defined by somebody else. We've got to get away from assigning people a platform. It's one of the reasons why I, you know, have this format. Just this week, I had a bunch of young kids from my hometown who are pro opening the schools here in California where we struggle to get this stuff right. And, and this is not a statement any, anyway, it's hard to deal with the global pandemic, but then also the well being academically and mentally of, of these young kids. And so I simply gave them a platform and allowed them to speak and, and say things like we don't have a seat at the table as the union and the school board and the parents all talk, nobody is allowing us to speak. And, and that exercise and allowing a civic voice for kids got people upset that kids were speaking. And, and I'm saying kids now, wow. I called them students because some of these students are going to be in college next year, you know, and so they, they're going to be in charge of their own day to day decisions. So it's time to start giving them some responsibility. We've got to do a better job of that, Lou. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally hear you. And, and it's this uh, it's this weird idea, but like what you just described you know, you take something like climate change and uh, Greta Thunberg was a big spokesperson. Uh, a lot of people um, sort of hid behind her for cover, you know. So on that issue, it was OK to basically have a um, to exploit a child. Sure. Right. But then in the example that you're giving, we're here are kids actually, you know, talking about. I mean, just how nuts is this sound? We want to go back to school. Like, how bad are things yeah. where kids are like, we we need to go back? Shut also, up! Stay yeah, out of I'm school. Yeah. Yeah. And and also and, and also, I mean, re, you know, for I, I don't know for however long, but uh, I saw recently like the CDC was like, it is it is so important that we get kids back in school ASAP. The CDC. And, yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine like what you know what those kids are are going through, and and also you know, being in a position where, where they're experiencing being shouted down, right. um, you know, as opposed to actually be, uh, you know, be, taking part in a debate because, Hey, if they're wrong, then they're, then they're wrong, but at least let them speak. about it. Yeah. And then when you bring the comedic aspect of this in, it's hard not to mock things like this, like your article with uh, Ibram X. Kendi, it's hard to take that guy seriously because he can't even define terms. Cause as soon as he stands on a principle, you can say, white privilege. You shouldn't have done that. You know, like everything that he's trying to change, it's all, it's all in sand. And so it's easy to mock things like that because it's not, here's an academic who can't define terms because defining something is, is power and, and well, it gets really tough. Well, well I think, I mean, that might be a reason why he's basically come up with this, with this ideology, this rubric where everything, every human interaction uh, every policy or result of a policy is one of two things. It's either racist or anti-racist. Now, just imagine, like, I'm, I'm going to be 39 years old uh, this month, and I'm looking back at my life, and I'm like, I think things are a little bit more complicated than that. I think, I think <laughs> things are a little bit more complicated than racist or anti-racist. And, and he's a guy who I believe should be called to account for the stuff that he said and the stuff that he does, especially if he wants to, you know, make those, uh, you know, make that very simplistic, dualistic, those terms. And uh, he, I guess, got into a, a little bit of a controversy because I guess it's probably already gone right, right now. But he was speaking to a, a group uh, for a New York state. I think it's a, the New York State Association of Independent Schools. And they had a, an e-seminar. And on Twitter, somebody uploaded about a minute, 50 seconds or so of Ibram X. Kendi uh, talking. And in, in, in that little clip, what he said was he had this anecdote about his daughter coming home the other day 
and saying that she wanted to be a boy. His daughter saying that she wanted to be a boy. And he said that both he and his wife were horrified. They used that word horrified about this, hearing their daughter uh, talk, uh, you know, say such a thing. And he started, he and his wife started talking about, you know, what sort of messages are she, is she hearing in our home or outside of it that would make her want to be a boy? And then he went on and uh, the rest of the, uh, of the other, you know, 20 seconds or so is devoted to him finding a parallel between how that might be kind of like race. People hear thing, hear messages, affirmative messaging when it comes to race. So uh, maybe people of color want to be white or white, you know, just, a, just all this stuff. The real focus of it was what he said about, you know, him saying that, that he and his wife were horrified that his daughter might want to be a boy. And a number of people jumped on that and said, aha, transphobic. Aha, this is transphobia. This is an example here. And why is it even it's, you know, doubly problematic? Because here you have the anti-racist high priest, right? <laughs> the, the cornerstone of woke, you know? <laughs> coming out and saying that he and his wife are horrified, right? About uh, the possibility that his daughter might want, might actually be a boy. And people, you know, jumped on it. And uh, basically what, <laughs> what, what came of it was, you know, a, a good lesson in, in hypocrisy uh, because he was not punished. He was not canceled for that. A lot of people pointed out that had he been a different person, had he uh, been especially a figure on the right, he would have been pilloried. He would have been. He would have lost. You know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of jobs and uh, and and that sort of thing. And I was just uh, pointing out, trying to make you know a couple of points in the piece that I wrote for Spike. One is, uh, I see what the person was doing when they uploaded this little clip, and it's playing on what is sort of the basis nature of social media, where it's you're going to take this little clip. It, it's it's 50 seconds from an hour long conversation, and we're going to use this as a reason to tear somebody down. And I'm not a, I, I I don't get behind that. I wish that this guy was just taken to task more for how dumb his ideas are, and allow the market to decide that. But if you look at the market, this dude is doing real, <laughs> real well, man. He's got like a. He's got like an anti-racist research center. He's a founder of it at Boston University. I hear he just got, I think, th uh, a, a three-project deal at Netflix. He's got uh, books on the best uh, on the New York Times bestseller. He's doing well. So in the world that he describes, the society, right, that has, uh, you know, uh, the outcomes can either be racist or anti-racist. This dude is cleaning up. This dude is cleaning up in this society. <laughs> It's hard to take rage against the machine seriously when they're, you know, multi, multi, multi millionaires. It's like, well, what are you so mad at now? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, well, I saw, well, uh, recently in regards to rage against the machine, I saw a, a promo for, uh, Tommy Morello, who's the, the guitarist, fantastic guitar player, yes. right? The promo, I think, I don't know if he has a book coming out or something like that. It said speaking truth to power. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, it's like, hold on. Are there, you the buddy. one listening, Tommy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like, hold on there, buddy. It's a lot easier to speak truth to power in the United States uh, where you are constantly, you know, shitting on it um, and then go around uh, basically wearing a fucking Che Guevara shirt. Yeah. You know, that's uh, like Che Guevara is part of their iconography. Right. You know, Che Guevara, who uh, assassinated, who, who killed people without trial and you know just uh, all these number of of of, uh, of different things. So you know there's there's something there's something fun about pointing out hypocrisy, and part of it is because especially doing comedy, it's just that it's a it's a never ending wellspring. You know, it's just always going to be there. Absolutely, and you're you're one of the good examples of social media. Like I, I love I love your feed. In fact, I probably know your comedy more through Twitter, wherever than than through stand up, but. It cuts both ways. So I, I'm, I'm like, what, in your opinion, what's the good of uh, the media? And I'm, I'm thinking more, I guess, from a comedic standpoint. And also, what's the evil of it or the wrong of it that you would like to see affected in, in the future? Yeah. So I, I think I think one of the goods, the good things to come about with doing comedy uh, through social media is it's definitely a way to get around 
traditional gatekeepers. And, you know, just look at how successful people have been when it comes to podcasting. You know, the idea that, oh, you're doing radio, but you don't need a radio station. You know, you're doing radio, but you don't have to worry about the FCC uh, coming, mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming at you. That's amazing. You know, that, that, that's, that's fantastic. The ability to get your work out there to people that, you know, would never be able to see you, you know, or, or during, you know, something, uh, you know, during something like a pandemic where say you are, you know, a touring comedian and, you know, clubs are closing down or you can't, you know, can't get out there to clubs. There's a way to find, there's the ability to find other ways to monetize or to, you know, to get out there uh, and perform. I think one of the, one of the downsides though, about, you know, putting so much stuff on social media and, and, and trying to develop stuff there is that uh, people are used to just getting stuff for free. You know, mm -hmm. people are used to just, you can laugh at a hundred jokes that a comedian's put, you know, put out there and not pay a dime for it, you know? So I think that might just be more of a cultural thing where it's, where it's sort of like uh, trying to express and, and try to be more of a, of a evangelist for, Hey, if you like what this comedian is doing, if you like what this writer is doing or any of these other creators, please go and try to support them, you know, but try to, you know, try to help them uh, along the way. So that's, that's where I would say. Nice. And I love your comments. Like, like a, a lot of times you're willing to engage with, I don't necessarily always want to call them trolls, but people who disagree with you or trying to, I don't know, be funny back. But when, when you ever like, okay, this is worthwhile or other, I'm just going to forget this. This is, this is a waste of my time. Oh yeah, no, it definitely. And it's something where I've had to, I've had to pull myself, pull myself back. Um, a couple of years ago, I was spending way too much time online. I was working, working too much and you check the clock and I'm like, man, I've been sitting at this computer. It's 10 PM. I've been sitting here since 8 AM. You know, some of it I was getting work done, you know, but for the most part, it was just, uh, getting into these, into these, uh, arguments or conversations that were going to go nowhere, you know? Um, <laughs> So I think for, for a lot of people, you know, the goal of an internet argument isn't to win, it's to waste the other person's time. <laughs> and and I, I, have, I have, you know, been on the losing end of that quite a bit. I spoke to my, 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 my wife kind of had an intervention with me and, and she started, you know, <laughs> and she was saying, look, you should start looking at all this stuff as what are you putting into this versus, you know, what are you getting out of it? Uh -huh. And if you're putting more into it than you're getting out of it, well, then it's time to, to move on to, to something else. So I treat that the same way with, um, you know, quote unquote trolls. You know, some of them we have fun together and it's an enjoyable experience. Others, what becomes crystal clear is that, oh, they don't really care. You know, the, the, yeah. these people, are, they, they wouldn't be willing to take me out for a coffee and to actually have a conversation face to face. So it's like, why am I giving my time to them? Mm -hmm. And then also, I think, uh, I think one of the, the ways of taking sort of like the negativity and turning it into something good is to see, well, what am I learning about myself and also about people through these engagements? You know, what, what, uh, what can I take away? What material can I glean from this? And uh, fortunately, I've been able to, you know, to, to take that material and to, and, and to use it. And uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. So one of the videos that I did uh, was like a short monologue, just basically about you know, people who are offended and, uh, you know, when you're putting out, you know, dozens of jokes a day, you're, you're going to offend someone, you know, every now and then. And what I found was when I offend somebody on the left, for the most part, they, they get the joke, they don't think it's funny and they think I'm a bad person for telling it. When I offend somebody on the right, they don't get the joke. They don't think it's, <laughs> They don't think it's funny and they think they can kick my ass. So it's sort of <laughs> these two extremes. And then I keep seeing the same, you know, the same sort of characters uh, pop up. And it was like, oh, wow, I think I learned something about, about humanity, or at least humanity online, you know, through these little interactions. <laughs> well, you, you've done a good job through the pandemic of, of keeping content <laughs> yeah. out there and, and you know, st staying relevant. But I, I'm curious, what your writing process like for live shows, and I'm talking more stand-up sketch versus when you're posting online. Yeah, um, it's one of those things where I don't spend enough time writing for live shows that, as I should. When it comes to anything that I produce uh, in the sketch realm, we're talking rewrites and rewrites, like sometimes 
eight versions of a script before, you know, before it goes out there. Like there's so much attention that I give to it. There's something about the live stuff where I don't know, I, I keep putting it off and putting it off and be like, oh, I'll work it out on its feet and all that. And I don't know, it, it might be something, it, it might be something psychological that I have, like sort of a fear where, oh man, if I put all this work in to this, um, you know, to this bit and then it doesn't work live, it's sort of that immediate failure <laughs> that, I, that I'm still, that I still need to get over as opposed to, you know, uh, well, I put all this work in uh, for a sketch and there were a bunch of other people with eyes on it. So they were able to help me out too. I'm not alone on this. If it fails, I got a lot of people to blame uh, for it. <laughs> but, um, but I think one of my, one of my goals uh, definitely is to um, devote uh, devote more time to to writing for uh, for stand up in particular. And you know, and you know, Matt, you know how it is too, where you have like you have great you have great ideas in there or bits they were like this is like five years old like why why how did i let this thing age how did i let this grow up without <laughs> you know without trying to explore this uh this further so so that's something that i'm i'm you know trying to do uh more of it's one of the goals because uh, and i'd say that because a lot of your stuff is so sharply written and it's really enjoyable to just like see it on a screen and then Sometimes we wonder how does that translate to a live audience? Is, is it is it is it punchier or is it nullified because you know there's 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 someone spilling beer in front of them? You know, it's always like, what works online versus what doesn't you know, oh, in front of. Yeah, some, some, I, th I, th I think I think I think there are definitely things that work better as tweets and should stay as tweets and <laughs> and be forgotten uh, as tweets. <laughs> um, <laughs> whereas you know sometimes you have like. Uh, uh, you know, just just really nice zingers, you know, that, that are there. But then it but then it's sort of um, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a sort of a one liner uh, type of a comedian where it's just, you know, joke, 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 joke. Like, you know, someone like David Tell is just I mean, just yeah. phenomenal on that. Mark Norman as well is, is building up bits where every, it's just even right. One of the best at that. He, that is so dense yeah. with his con uh, yeah. pun. Yeah, where, where, where a lot of the stuff that, that I that I do when I try to do live is, is um, you know, kind of crafting bits out of stories um, mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, working, uh, you know, working that way. How do you stay funny on Twitter without getting uh, hammered? I mean, I, I'm literally in Twitter jail probably for the rest of my life because I'm not I'm never going to go take down the tweet because it was fucking funny. And so I'm going <laughs> to let it just be there. And I don't care if I get to use Twitter again. But but when when the audience is someone you can't actually interact with who hasn't read a book, you know, <laughs> how do you, how do you remain funny on these things? Because it's, I mean, I wasn't trying to get kicked off of Twitter. Brad was, <laughs> I wasn't. And, and all of a sudden it's like, I don't need your shitty platform to put my funny Zachary Taylor joke out. Well, <laughs> you, you had a Zachary, you had a, a what's it a, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of uh, what's a tip of canoe, but no, that's, no, that's, no, Harrison, that's, that's, right? that's Harrison. I, I, that's a couple presidents before this is old rough and ready. Yeah. That's exactly what I, mean. I wasn't ready um, for that. Yeah. I, um, well, you know, fortunately I haven't been kicked off of uh, either Twitter or Facebook yet. And I, I'm, I'm some, sometimes surprised uh, because I've, I've the amount of people that, that show up in my feed who are like, yeah, I'm back from 60 days of uh facebook jail and i'm part of me is like why did you even come back like that sounds like <laughs> that sounds like such a great excuse never to come back to the you know to this platform ever again like you you, you, had, you took the there's an easy way out man uh, it's almost like you're breaking back into the jail um but but you know i, I think i you know I, I think it's it's one of those things where you're uh you know you sort of uh buoyed by the people by, by the people who follow you regularly and like the stuff that you do and, and will interact um you know so that's definitely helpful and you know i, ha I sort of have like a go-to thing uh if i'm if i'm getting particularly annoyed with somebody and most of the time they're they're anonymous so I, I always offer um you know like 50 bucks if they reveal who they are and that but but the but the you know the catch is i get to share that information with, with everybody like i ask to see resumes often you know it's uh, <laughs> resumes and, and pictures and stuff you know if somebody's talk, so talking cool. about my big forehead it's like yeah i know i got a big forehead but let's see what you look like man you know 
I didn't have this big forehead when I was 25. Your age, dude. <laughs> you know, rip, ripping raw dog 68, uh, you know, with a fucking uh, anime uh, Avi. Like, come on, dude. Let's see what you look like. <laughs> there's uh there's something to be said too for the face-to-face requirements for it to be funny and let me let me back up if um if the person judging the comedy isn't capable of judging comedy like okay you're a fact checker whatever the fuck that means but it's a and I, I, my my challenge was it's a joke you know about a guy that's been dead for 170 years and then it was violent because I said, if people don't knock it off with this uh, this presidential impeachment stuff after the lady tried to impeach Joe Biden, um, just keep your grubby paws off Wait, of Zachary Taylor. Z- Zachary Taylor, you know, otherwise he's going to punch you in the mouth by proxy. So not only did I say it wasn't even Zachary Taylor, it was be like one of his minions that would do it. It was patently ridiculous, you know, that right. Zachary Taylor would somehow be impeached, reanimate. And then command someone to punch somebody in the mouth. It was so it was so nonviolent, but it may even be a bad joke. But how can you, if someone says this is a joke, how do you read that thing and go, nope, that's inciting violence? Yeah, that 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 just sounds insane. The the fact that 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 that's what what got you you know kicked off, man. That's that's uh yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, and it's it's weird. It's weird the way that that words are thrown around like something like incitement you know and and it's and i wonder how many people actually know what that word means or at least how the word has been codified in law you know the the amount of people saying oh this is incitement doubtful that they heard a brandenburg brandenburg case right very doubtful that they they uh they heard about that um i don't know i i think uh, i think there are a lot of people uh who will never be in the position to hire or fire somebody where the only way that they actually get to remove people is by, you know, jumping on a, uh, joining a mob online and, and saying, ah, I got this person out or I'm reporting you, you know, like, can you, ima- I can't imagine reporting somebody. It's like the world's imagine, become an HOA, a really shitty HOA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like it's like really my fence is three inches too high really and now you're gonna burn down my house because yeah. of that? you're never allowed to buy another house yeah. right right exactly exactly <laughs> oh man it's ridiculous so the other day in the la times a lady wrote a wonderful op-ed um where her maybe you guys saw this her trumpite neighbor shoveled her second home's driveway up in Big Bear or wherever it was, you know, so, so she lives somewhere in Hollywood and obviously has a nice living because she can afford a home in Big Bear with a lot of snow. And, and she likened him to the Nazis, Louis Farrakhan, oh. Hezbollah. Wow. This is someone who asked for nothing in return, just did them a solid of shoveling the snow from their yard. And she's like, I know deep where inside me, I should probably thank him. But mostly, I want to call him a monster. Why is he doing this? There's some kind of nefarious plot. And there needs to be like a funnier die about this. I, uh, I I wanted to read that. I saw a number of people sharing that. But unfortunately, the LA Times are behind a paywall. You know, mm-hmm. So it, in order to be able to read this very privileged woman's uh, writing, I have to, you know, fork over, uh, you know, like five bucks a month or or, or something like that. Um, it, it, when, when I hear something like that, I'm wondering, is come on, is that is that parody? Is that for real? Um, you know, compare it's and it's sort of a, what what a mixture. You know, let's I'm going to pick the Nazis and Louis Farrakhan and Hezbollah. Um, you know, for someone, it, it, and it's funny just looking at you, I, you start thinking like when you start making those. Um, you know, she starts drawing those uh, those uh, those lines. You know, it's sort of what's the follow-up uh, follow-up article in response to her it's like oh wait hezbollah do you support israel is that why <laughs> you know oh you you brought up louis farrakhan and compared him to a nazi you obviously must be racist you obviously have a problem with uh you know black solidarity and and, and the you know the movements they're in obviously the nazis okay yeah that's, that's an easy one you can get a right. you can get a pass on uh it, it it's it, it's just so it, it's just so odd i i was on a I was on a, a podcast not too long ago, and um, 
the uh, the host was talking about uh, about where he lived, and he happens to live in the South, and a lot of the the assholes that he has to deal with uh, in his life there were Trump supporters. And it's like, and, and I'm like, man, that sucks. It sucks that for one that you're dealing with jerks and they're Trump supporters, and he'd had like legit threats on his life, and it's like, come on, that that, that that's that, that's gross. That's disgusting. And he thought that, you know, I would have, you know, maybe similar, you know, similar interactions. And I had to explain to him, like, dude, I live in Brooklyn. So every asshole that I have to deal with is a Biden Harris supporter, you know, and it's just it's just the reality of, look, just because you you vote for, quote unquote, the right candidate, it doesn't make you a good person. It doesn't make it doesn't make you the type of person who like the, the woman in the L.A. Times describing this guy who hey, just goes out of his way. And it's like, oh, I, I see a neighbor who's in need. I'll go, I'll go help them out. Not think much of it. Probably never thought that he would be the, uh, you know, the centerpiece in a, uh, you know, in a Los Angeles times article. Um, and I, I think, I think really simple, you know, simple, boring people will rely on, you know, these, uh, you know, tribal, uh, affiliations as a way, you know, not to deal with the fact that, you know, they might be, they might need some help. They might need some growth. They might need to work on themselves a little bit, you know, so. One of the things that uh, she says in the article, and I'm glad to cut and paste and send it to you, you know, the, the LA Times, I get over it. But the, uh, the one of the things they say <laughs> is, she's like, it sucks when your neighborhood isn't full of people like you. And I'm just like, Whoa. I'm glad you're saying this in public. Like, this is fantastic right. so that we can all understand what bigotry and intolerance look like, you know, because here yeah. it is, you know, we're all wired to be intolerant and bigots, but can we evolve past it? Can you realize when you say something like that, like, oh, I love black people. I have a black friend or whatever, you know, these things all work to our disadvantage when we say these things. And when you say that, you, you know, you're, you talk about privilege and here you have two homes and one of them is right. in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> right. It just gets a little bit, it's a little bit hard to, I'm glad it's public so that we can all see how much we're all assholes you know, <laughs> and lighten up a little bit, you know? Um, I, I think someone recently on Twitter said that um, they enjoy being able to argue at a, at a dinner table. You know, it's really, it's, they, they like having arguments with people who obviously they just, you know, they disagree with each other and being able to come together at a dinner, ta dinner table and, and argue is very important for them. And I responded by saying, I think it's great when you're able to hang out with people at a dinner table who have original ideas. I mean, <laughs> you know, for, forget about the arguing, you know, I, I, like somebody with something original, original to say that that's great. And I think one of the problems too, and again, I, I didn't read the, the LA times uh, piece, but you know, based on how you're just describing the woman, you know, you do wonder what does her social circle look like? You know, and oftentimes you have uh, people in particular, you know, well off college educated people who seem to just kind of hang out with those same people and, you know, not to, you know, toot my own horn, but I think I'm very fortunate in that I have so many people in my life who are not in my industry, who are not trying to be comedians, who are not trying to be writers. I'm the son of a butcher. I have three brothers who are butchers. I have another brother who is a school teacher. I have cousins who work, uh, who are tin knockers. Uh, I have, I have people, uh, I know quite a few people who smoke. Uh, Sam Harris made a point uh, uh, on one of his podcasts a while ago. He's like, I don't have anybody in my social circle who smokes. I don't have, you know, and it's that, it's that, that small element of, well, it's like, well, what are the conversations that you're having? And you have so many people who uh, they don't know what it's like to run a business. They don't know what it's like to run a business that fails. They don't know what it's like to, you know, you know, be be out of work because, you know, something like COVID hits. Yeah. And they get to live in sort of this, you know, this uh, not a fantasy world, a real world that they have constructed with people who are just like them. And therefore, the rest of the world must be just like them. Yeah, that that reminds me of a, a post you had pretty recently, Lou, where you said something to the effect of uh, anyone who can't afford fifteen dollars an hour to pay someone shouldn't be in business. You know, signed Amazon. And I, I kind of thought a little bit about your background because was your I know your 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 father you mentioned was he a butcher. Did he have to like hire and fire people or? 
I'm, I'm not, not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I, I haven't checked in with them on, on that front, um, uh, on the business for, uh, for a on the while. HR angle. <laughs> I might have to hit them up for a job real soon. But, but it just reminds I mean, I'm, even if not, he worked all business uh, in a, a very competitive industry. It, it definitely, and, ha- <clears throat> it definitely so curious, has an like, impact. Yeah. How did that color you on, on an issue like minimum wage, for instance, which is really competition, I think, more than any. Yeah, like on on that front, you know, uh, you, so you know, as a you know, as a butcher, uh, you, know, uh, you have to have certain skills, right? So uh, I used to I used to have a a roommate in Los Angeles who was a musician. He was a band. He was in a band. He used to write uh, jingles for commercials. He used to write music for uh, um, for TV shows. He was doing really well. Right. He's doing even even better now. Now, if my dad wanted to hire him as a butcher, well, he's not worth shit as a butcher because he's not because he doesn't know the trade. Right. So the idea that you're going to say, well, no, you have to pay him fifteen dollars an hour, even though this guy doesn't have the skills. It just doesn't make doesn't make any sense. And also um, having um, you know a family that works in, in retail. You know, the idea is, you know, how much are you producing an hour? You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes the business business is slow and maybe you've taken care of, um, you know, uh, five customers and all five of them all together. They, they were, uh, you know, say forty five dollars. It's like, well, how does that break down then when it comes to well, how much did, you know, how much did the product cost before you, you know, made the cuts, how much is the overhead and all that. There's all these factors that, that go into it long before we even get to greed, you know, long, like in order for you to be greedy, you got to deal with all this other shit first. You have all this other overhead between, you know, before you even hit, uh, hit to uh, get, get to like one of the seven deadly sins. Yeah. Well, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. Boy, we oh, jumped you... to some big conclusions, you know, it's just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me, I want to go back to the comedy stuff and, and try to, as we kind of get towards the end here, what are you working on right now? Like what's on top of mind for you? Where, where do you think you're your funniest right now? Yeah. So, uh, something that I'm really excited about, uh, is I'm getting back into producing sketch comedy. So over the past couple of months, I've spent time, uh, writing, uh, producing, shooting, and right now we're in post-production on a number of sketches. And tonight I'm going to be releasing the first one. And this is the first sketch that I've released, man, in I think over five months, something like that. So this is, uh, it's, uh, it's been a long time, uh, long time coming. So if people can uh, go to my, my YouTube page, um, that's where I'll be releasing um, new sketches. And then also on top of that, I've been doing a, a podcast of my own since uh since early october of last year so i'm excited about that as well i'm I'm particularly excited about just uh the the types of people that i'm able to get on you know where it's like oh so and so is the former president of the aclu and she's down to talk to me for an hour that's (laughs) that's pretty cool yes um and i think going back to like what you were saying matt like asking the question of you know what's you know some of the upsides of this I mean, that's definitely one of them. I mean, sure. with the technology that we have, you're able to, you know, talk to um, some of the most brilliant, interesting people out there. And, you know, look at, you know, people like Joe Rogan, who's made a whole, you know, industry and brand of like, here's a here's a comedian, a, an, a, a you know, someone who's very interested in the world and stuff. And it's like, well, what happens when you get a nuclear physicist <laughs> and a comedian together. What are they going to talk about? Uh, so that that's that's been one of the really fun things too about uh, social media, about technology, being able to put together these juxtapositions that otherwise really wouldn't. I don't think that would ever actually happen. And what what are your favorite types of guests? How do you want to see your show over the years? Yeah. So I think my favorite types are people who have made something that I really enjoyed. And I just want other people to know that what they made is out there. So um, two examples I had, uh, there's a, an amazing documentary called Red Dog. 
about a saloon slash go-go bar strip club in Oklahoma City. And it's, uh, it's notorious. And uh, there's a documentary uh, about it. And, the, and the, one of the documentary makers is a, is a guy named Luke Dick, who is a singer-songwriter. And also his mother used to be a dancer and a bartender at this strip club. Right. So it's a it's an amazing documentary telling that story. And uh, one night my wife and I watched it and I was like, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to hit that guy up. But, oh, it looks like he has a Facebook page. Let, let me see if I can get him. And he got back to me and boom, I got him. I have him on coming up. I have a uh, there, another documentary uh, called Pigeon Kings, um, which I think I watched probably like the next day after Red Dog. So Pigeon Kings is about. People like guys where the sport is flying pigeons. They fly pigeons overhead and it's a particular kind of pigeon that does like loop de loops and 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 the the more uh spins and turns they have, the more points you get. And they're out in they're out in LA. They're out in like like Englewood, you know right? So you have a community of you know of 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 guys in LA flying pigeons <laughs> and and somebody made a documentary about it. And I'm gonna have uh, uh, two of the two of the figures uh, featured in the documentary on, as well as the the filmmaker, and it's like that that kind of stuff. That the, I wish that I could. I wish I had more of an infrastructure where I was able to do more of that, and maybe one day I'll, I'll be able to get mm -hmm. to the point. But I I feel like you know definitely spending so much time online. There's so much to be angry about. There's so much to be uh, you know to get swept up in there's so much time to be wasted where when you when you actually find something that you know makes a makes even just the smallest impact on your life or how you see the world those stories that you want to tell it's like oh we got to just boost that as much as we can and and that's what i hope to to, to be able to do more of it's one of the best things about having a show is is you just get to collect all these incredible, incredible people. You're like, this is what you do. Like, just it's it's shocking, some of these lives that you get to interact with. And like you said, they they say yes. I mean, you said yes. You know, people say yes to doing this, and it's it's such a life fulfilling and enriching thing. It's it's uh it's changed my life to have a show, and I I appreciate you coming on and everything. I don't want to take too much more of your time. But I'll let Matt close out, but I, I appreciate the hell out of you for coming on, Matt. Oh, thanks for having me, yeah. guys. And I, I, too, appreciate the hell out of having Lou Perez come on. Uh, so for folks out there, you know, obviously, podcasts, where, where can they get more Lou? Yeah. Um, so you can go to my website, theluperez.com, and you can follow me on most social media at theluperez. And also, uh, you know, if you're, if you're interested in supporting, I am on locals.com, theluperez.locals.com. Yeah, go to Locals and support them. Support the Break It Down show on YouTube by subscribing and hit the reminder bell so that way you know when we go live. Uh, we have a little PayPal link where you can just drop a couple of dollars in either every month or if you feel like supporting the show. All that money goes right back into the show as an investment. That's how you can support us. You can always support Save the Brave at savethebrave.org. You can go there. Same thing. You can just do a monthly donation or a one-time thing. If you're interested in your town supporting Save the Brave, We'll come out and we'll figure out how to put together an event and get some businesses together and, and do something big for charity. And if it's not Save the Brave, do something. As long as you're doing something for charity, you're doing the right thing. And thank you, Matt, for setting all these up. I appreciate you. Thank you.